My name is Dr. Sulat Dreyfus. I'm the host of this afternoon's session. Um, I'm a researcher and lecturer at the University of Melbourne's Department of Computing and Information Systems, but I'm actually much groovier than that sounds. Um, we've got a fantastic panel today to talk about a pretty interesting subject. We'll be taking a tour through the US elections uh, along the way, um, how voting works in Australia and how may work in the future, and what we can expect um, on our horizon. So without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about our panel members. Um, I'm gonna take questions in the middle of the session as well as after, so if you've got a question about something we're talking about along the way, jump in, put your hand up. Uh, we've got a throwable cube. Where is the cube? Ah, the orange cube, it's great. Okay, so we'll get you the cube, throw you the cube, you talk into the Trump cube colors. and it acts just like a microphone, it's very exciting. <laughs> so uh, our first guest is Marcy Wheeler. She has flown all the way from Grand Rapids, Michigan, halfway around the planet. Um, she is our US expert on, ele on elections. She is described as an investigative blogger. You can find her at Empty Wheel. I recommend you all immediately go and follow her. She'll be very happy about that. Um, she's formerly a writer for The Intercept and Fire Dog Lake. She understands the deep state and the rules that are bent to create mass surveillance and also the foibles of all sorts of three-letter agencies in the US, CIA, FBI, NSA, and various others. She's possibly the top US blogger, actually, in this state. And when she's not meeting uh, sources in darkened car parks, she's wading through spook and hack claims to understand what really happened with the recent US election, and she tells it like it is, including an infamous reference to White House blowjobs on national television in the United States. Welcome, Marcy. Anthony Green, election analyst for the ABC. Um, he is our king of democracy sausages uh, and how they are made. Um, he has been uh, covering uh, more than, well, 70 elections, in fact, more than 70 elections for the ABC nationally, state, uh, and territory. Uh, he previously had worked as a data analyst for the New South Wales government and a programmer. In fact, he designs his own databases um, and writes software just for himself. Um, he doesn't write multi-user software, as he was keen to point out to me. Uh, he's got a Bachelor of Science in Math and Computing and a degree in Economics and Honours in Politics. He has newly been appointed a Order of Australia, which he's going to handily pick up in September. Congratulations to you, Anthony. <laughs> Woo! Well deserved. And he's worked at the ABC since 1989, which is definitely deserving of an Order of Australia. <laughs> Um, and he's an adjunct professor at Sydney University in the Department of Government and International Relations. Our final guest is Dr. Vanessa Teague. She is a colleague of mine at the University of Melbourne's Department of, uh, now School of Computing and Information Systems. Um, she is an internationally recognized expert in electronic voting. Um, I am myself familiar with her work. It is very impressive, take my word for it. She has a PhD from Stanford University in California, so she is no slouch. She wrote her thesis on cryptography for some light fireside reading. Um, and she studied and found flaws in electronic voting systems, including right here in Australia. So a big welcome round of applause, please, for all of our guests. Now, if I can actually start um, with you, Marcy. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of interference can be done in elections? Um, and uh, how widespread has it been in the last 80 or so years that we know of? Well, I'm gonna, I'll talk about what allegedly happened last year in the US election, and we can come back and talk about how much some governments have tampered in other people's elections. But the four things that allegedly happened in last year's presidential election in the US were one, the collection of information. Um, the FSB was sitting on servers, not just of Democrats, and just collecting information and doing nothing with it for over a year before the election. Can we just clarify FSB? Is, um, it's one of Russia's spy agencies. Um, <laughs> so, but that stuff happens all the time. That is just the collection of information. What was allegedly new, although I don't buy this either, is that after 
sitting on those servers for a long period of time. The Russians then took emails and other documents and sent them to a character named Guccifer 2.0, a website called DC Leaks, and most spectacularly, WikiLeaks. Um, and there's some question of whether all of those documents came from the same sources, but in the United States, that was called weaponizing the information with the claim, the false claim, that the United States has never done that. The third thing that happened was tampering with the voter registration databases. So in the United States, our elections are very federalized and each state sort of runs their own election and they're you know, run in various uh, strengths and qualities. And uh, Russia alleg allegedly probed at least 20 states voter registration databases, which is just a list of who can vote. Um, and the fear was that they would then take people off of that registration, people would show up and try and vote, and they wouldn't be able to vote. That happens all the time in US elections because Republicans especially make sure that it happens all the time, but it was meant to be new and different because the Russians did it, or might have done it, that, uh, although the evidence says that they didn't. Um, then finally, the Russians are alleged to have targeted fake news to particular voters. So I live, in, I live in Michigan, which is one of the three states which was supposed to be won by Hillary Clinton, was instead won by Trump, and that made all the difference. And if you know, Trump ruins the rest of the world, I'm sorry, that was my state. Um, but the report is that the Russians sent out fake stories on Facebook to women and people of color in my state. And that made, the, my state was won by Trump by 10,000 votes. And the story is that was enough to make a difference in my state. Now, that relied on Facebook's algorithms. So the, you know, one question we can talk about is whether that's the Russians' fault or whether that's Facebook's fault or some combination of the two. Two things that didn't happen or are not alleged to have happened in last year's election are one, um, our elections are all run by analytics. So Hillary Clinton, when deciding where to send bodies, didn't sit down as a human being and decide where to send bodies. She had uh, algorithms do it for her. And my, you know, if I wanted to steal an election, I would, I would hack somebody's analytics program. And uh, thus far, no one has alleged that. I suspect we may come around and find that to be alleged. And so then when, when, can I just jump in and say, when you say somebody, that would be like a polling organization who would try and measure before the election how Hillary was going in Michigan, that sort of thing. Right, I mean, the easiest way, when the, when the United States hacked the Iranian nuclear program, we made sure that the Iranians could not see their centrifuges blowing up. And so sometimes I say, I'm, a, I'm like a blowing up centrifuge because I live in Michigan. The way to prevent Hillary from adjusting to things happening on the ground is to make her think she's going to win Michigan. Uh, she thought she was going to win Michigan. No one knows why she thought she was, but there's no indication that was because of hacking. And then the final thing, and, and the most spectacular thing, which was not alleged to have happened last year, is our voting machines are all state by state. There are entire states that vote with no paper trail. Um, and it, it is child's play to hack those machines, as Vanessa will tell us later on. And there is no allegation that Russians or anybody else hacked those machines, although that has for, since 2000 at least, that has been the big concern that uh, our elections will be hacked that way. So if I can just follow that up, um, uh, to delve a little bit more deeply into this, in 1972, quite spectacularly, the Nixon campaign enlisted um, operatives to break into and bug the Democrat headquarters, known as Watergate. Uh, and the FBI undertook a very detailed criminal investigation and five burglars were eventually indicted, although not apparently all their sponsors. Um, in this case, um, did the FBI take possession of evidence of hacking of the Democrats, Democrat National Convention servers, and if not, why not? Right, so this is a, this is a comedy of errors. The FBI started calling the DNC in summer of 2015 saying, hey, uh, look up this, um, this named hacking group. They're in your shorts. And the DNC kind of blew it off. They're like, we don't want to hear from the FBI. We don't want to hear from the FBI. And they didn't start responding until literally early 2016. They just took these FBI warnings and blew it off. When the DNC decided that they were in fact being hacked, they brought in a company called CrowdStrike, which is a private security company, rather than bringing in the FBI. 
And while CrowdStrike came in and imaged the DNC servers, the FBI never got their own direct copy and never were looking at the DNC servers directly. So in the States, there's some question about whether the FBI has the full picture of what happened. Can you tell us about some of the other hacks around this election so we get a full picture of the hacking landscape in the US election? So it wasn't just the DNC, it was also Hillary's campaign. Hillary's campaign manager, John Podesta, famously got hacked because he had because he didn't have two-factor authentication, so you guys should all have two-factor authentication. For those of you, so you who were there this morning at <laughs> so the session. So you don't look like John Podesta. Um, <laughs> there were Republicans who got hacked. So Mar Marco Rubio, who was one of Trump's opponents, got hacked, or, or they tried to hack him. Uh, Lindsey Graham, a kind of low-level Republican candidate, did get hacked. Um, Colin Powell, old former general who uh, was involved in ongoing foreign policy debates, he got hacked too. So the, the landscape of people who got hacked, uh, uh, the, the Democratic Congressional Committee, which is the people who try and elect members of our lower house, they also got badly hacked. So the range of entities that got hacked is very broad and, and there's you know some variability about the degree, even the public claims about which Russian entities were in the servers and which ones might not have been. So. And do we know with some degree of certainty the high likelihood of whether or not Russian government as opposed to Russian hackers might have actually played a role in each of those? The public attribution has been focused primarily on the DNC and John Podesta, people are pretty confident about who hacked John Podesta because it's very similar to stuff that Russia has done. And our government at least has been unequivocal that it was the Russian government that hacked the DNC and that hacked John Podesta. Um, I think in about a year's time, we will find that, in fact, Russia did hack both of those entities, but there's a whole lot of obfuscation which hasn't been publicly discussed yet that will explain why there are lots of doubts being raised about whether or not the Russians actually did it. And do you have any theories before we um, jump on to our other guests about uh, why? why they would have done it, what was their motivation? Well, I mean, quite simply, uh, Putin, going back to 2011, believes that the US was tampering in Russian elections, that, that was getting opposition figures to oppose, Trump, uh, to, to oppose Putin. And he blamed Hillary Clinton directly for that. Um, he believed that we broke promises in Libya. He believed that we broke promises and that we were responsible for a coup in Ukraine. You don't have to agree with any of that. He also believed that the United States set him up with the Panama Papers, the leak of lots of Russian corruption. Um, so you don't have to believe any of that, but Putin believes it. And so Putin not only thought that the United States and Hillary Clinton personally had done similar things to him and had threatened Russian sovereignty, um, but he also believed that Hillary Clinton was personally responsible. So he had a grudge against Hillary Clinton. And then um, more recently, and we've seen in the last couple weeks, evidence to support this, Trump has business dealings with a bunch of mobbed up Russian businessmen, and he has for years. And so there is good reason for Russia to prefer Trump because he has um, obligations to powerful Russians that Hillary Clinton did not have. And so there's a whole range of reasons why Putin would prefer Trump over Hillary and why he'd hate Hillary. And you know, it's, it doesn't take that, it doesn't take a lot of thinking for why, why Putin would risk this year to, to bring down Hillary and, and put Trump in place. We will come back to um, the US and revisit it. Anthony, can you walk us through how much of the Australian system uh, is, actual ma is actually manual versus automated in terms of our election systems? Well, most of it's manual still. Mm -hmm. um, you've always got to avoid the quick question of technological determinism. I mean, some people say, well, why is Australia still using ballot papers when China and Brazil are using computers? Um, the simple e reason is if you're going to adopt computers or some sort of technology like that, you have to have a reason for doing it. Mm -hmm. In the case of India and Brazil, it's to stop corruption. Mm -hmm. That people used to, in, you know, elections run in remote areas used to get ballot papers stuffed and, and false results. It's not hard to stuff and to ruin a paper-based ballot system if you've got a corrupt system. Um, 
the, one of the differences in Australia, and this is a big difference from the American system, elections are run at the top level. If you run a federal election, it's run by the Australian Electoral Commission, and it tries to set the same standard for everything across the country. In the United States, the elections are run by local government, so you go from state to state, from local government to local government, and you'll have different ballot papers, different methods of voting. The Americans, everyone talks about electronic voting, but there has been mechanical voting going back decades in the United States. And the simple reason why that's been developed in America is you run so many elections on the same day that you can't conduct them with like ballot papers like we do in Australia because you can't count them. If you've got 15 or 25 elections being held on one piece of paper, it's almost impossible to count manually because you've got to do all of them one after the other. You've got to keep doing the counting. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why some countries have got down that path and Australia hasn't. Um, we do have problems here. Um, our electoral role is all kept centrally. There is one electoral role for the country, which all the states and all the local governments and the federal government use. Um, <clears throat> there are some slight differences in enrolment from state to state. That role system is quite old. Um, if you want to get on the electoral roll in this country, you, have to, you can lodge an, a, an application, but you have to provide documents like driver's licenses and the like, and they've got to be sent in. So to get on the roll in the first place, you've got to have that. Um, you can initiate a transaction to change your address once on the roll, but that still goes through the process of being put into the system rather than actually you putting it into the system. You just set up a transaction which is dealt with afterwards. Um, and that also has to be checked off against, they have roll checks on things like addresses, on um, uh, addresses, they've got those sorts of checks. A third of enrolments now, changes are now done automatically based on social, on, um, social security and on tax taxation office records and in the States on driver's license records. Um, so there's a lot of those sorts of things going on with the role. It's not readily accessible by anybody. Um, and if you did access it, what we'll be doing. There's certainly no ability to delete records off it. Um, that has to be done quite specifically but by the, by the it commissions. It used to be the case, I know when I was working as a newspaper journalist, that you could actually go and look at a paper version of the electoral role in the public library. That's been hugely cut back. Mm. Um, you certainly, if you want to try and check someone's address, there's a, a site you can go to where you can check if someone's address. If you've got another address and you've got to go to the name properly and it's got to match the role or you just get a no match. Um, one of the security problems I have, there's a lot of movement to introducing electronic roll uh, Markov. And so the devices that have that have got the whole country's role on it. And there is some concern that they would be very, people would be very interested to seal, steal those. Um, so because they don't, the sell, role. they don't sell that information? No, certainly not. Um, one, one of the difficulties they have is that they have to give it to candidates and parties. The Commission hated doing that, but they have to, they have to do that by law. And so that data gets out there. Um, there are some, I mean, the country Liberal Party in the Northern Treasury was fined for the government using the data, which was provided to parties one day. Um, no doubt people have scanned, that, have scanned some of those roles and they've got access to it by various corrupt reasons. Um, but of course the role is constantly changing, so anybody who's got a snapshot of that data at some point has to try and steal it again to get it. But that data is of interest for people for commercial reasons. And that's, that's the biggest issue they have, is that, um, there's that people want that data for commercial reasons. Oh, so, just yeah. when we need more spam. <coughs> um, and uh, finally, there is a movement uh, in some states towards some forms of electronic voting that's already been in place. Um, but there are differences between the states and territories on that. Can you talk a little bit about who's covered, what that is, and uh, what the differences are in the systems that are used? Well, there is, th there's a series of problems. As I said, with um, you move down the path of electronic voting because you've got a reason for it. You don't just do it because you want to do it. The, fact, the idea that sometime in the next 30 years everybody will be voting by computer in schools I think is highly unlikely. Um, to set up an electronic voting place for one day is just a, a night, it's nightmare technically and then you've got the whole security issues as well. And what happens if it goes wrong and you've got to have all the ballot papers as backup. So it's just not going to happen. But they do have specific problems with voting. Um, overseas voters, um, the number of people who fill in ballot papers and send them back and they don't get back or they get lost or the number of people who end up you know, voting in the wrong electorate is, is enormous. They would really like to do something which is probably going to be partly internet, maybe intranet based for overseas voting and remote voting, which is part of the driver in the New South Wales experiment. Um, there is, uh, the postal service is declining. Postal voting will die because the postal service will die. 
um, is, is if they can't deliver. I mean, parts of Australia only have one delivery a week. So in parts of New South Wales, where the campaign is two and a half weeks long, um, you put your application in, the next post has got to deliver it, and then in the next post, you've got to post it back. So it's a really difficult time scale, and the Postal Service is getting worse. The ACT at the recent election, they had the highest late return of postal votes in history, and they put that down to the decline of the Postal Service. So postal, postal voting will die, and so you need a replacement for that, and that's where some of the push to sort of limited internet voting is coming from. And the third thing is the increase in pre-poll voting. Um, the sheer numbers, uh, over a third of voters at the last election voted before polling day. Vast numbers of them on, on polling, da polling day. The last Victorian election, only 55% of the vote was counted on the night. The other 35 was in ballot boxes or in po envelopes from before polling day. Uh, that is a major logistical problem the Electoral Commission to manage to count. Um, but if they have the votes early, so this is where you can show up to yeah. in the two weeks before the election and cast your physical ballot. Why is that difficult for them? You would think that they could count that early, no? Oh, it's illegal to count before six o'clock on the night. <laughs> Basically, you can change the law to count before six o'clock on the night. Um, in New Zealand, they count their pre-poll votes from nine in the morning so that they're released in batches after seven o'clock. But in New Zealand, it's illegal to campaign on polling day. So it's very easy to get scrutineers in to scrutiny the count. Um, there is no way they will allow counting unless scrutineers are present. And on, in Australia, because we campaign on election day, there's a difficulty in getting scrutineers available to observe the count. Um, the other thing that occurs with, uh, with, that, with the counting problem on the night is you've got staff all around the country running polling places and you've got to have other people sat around waiting to count vast, you know, thousands and thousands of votes at non-voting centres. So there's a, there's a number of things pushing towards doing something in that area. It would also diminish the number of um, uh, absent votes which are in the wrong electorate and take a week or two weeks to get back to the home district before counting. So there's logistical reasons which are driving it. Uh, it's a matter of how it's done. So when you're talking about that la last problem, what you mean is, you know, I'm, I'm on holidays here at Byron, there's an election, I live in Sydney, I go to my local... I go to a local place here, I want to vote, and they register, take my vote, but actually, in some way, it's mixed up because I didn't know what yeah. electorate, election I was supposed to be voting in for my local whatever election. 10% of people who voted postal and abs uh, absent and pre-poll at the last election were given the wrong ballot paper because they didn't get their electorate right. Um, now, the 11% the were wrong. Where they used the electronic roll mark off, the error rate was only 0.2%. So there's a 50-fold increase caused by the fact that they weren't using the technology. Um, what they could do in a place like this, and you know there's going to be vast numbers of people, you could set up a um, pre-poll voting centre where you can take electronic votes. So they'd actually do it manually at the moment. But there's a, a whole bunch of things like that that they, they take an interest in. Um, but uh, the, the ease of voting... One of the difficulties is people ask, why does it take two weeks to count the votes? Why does it take two weeks to finalise? Well, you could finalise it on the night, if you like, as they do in Britain. Um, but that would make absent voting impossible. It would make pre-poll voting difficult. And it would make postal voting almost impossible. Um, so you'd actually diminish the turnout. So, I mean, it's a trade-off you get. They could, like, I certainly think the number of ballot papers that get moved around the country afterwards could be done differently. Some of our states handle all that stuff centrally nowadays, which actually diminishes the amount of movement of ballot papers. Uh, but certainly, if you can take more of those electronically and you can do it safer, you, there's a number of votes in that area which will fix it. But the idea that it will become more broader than that. I mean, the ACT has used electronic voting for over a decade. They're still only taking a quarter of votes electronically. And that is because people don't want to do it? Well, it's because they only do them in pre-polls. Mm -hmm. They do them, um, the pre-poll centres they use are also polling places on the day, but the rest of the polling places are paper-based ba paper still. So, Vanessa, coming to you. Um, Vanessa has the uh, distinction um, of finding uh, a bug in the software in, um, in an election here in New South Wales. Uh, actually, it was for, there was count for local government and legislative council elections, is that right, here in New South Wales, so double hit. Um, I'm interested to know a little bit about, could this have changed any of the election results, this bug, and what happened exactly? 
Okay, let me lay out the landscape a little bit first because I think it's important to understand there are lots of different uses of computers in Australian elections. There's been electronic counting for a very long time, both in New South Wales and at a federal level, and also in Victoria, because the Senate votes and the local government and the upper houses of our parliaments all use this tremendously complicated single transferable vote proportional representation system that nobody can do by hand very anymore. So there's been electronic counting on computers Can forever. you just tell us for a second about what is that complexity? So imagine, say you're voting for the Senate. Mm -hmm. You're choosing your six senators, usually, except in the most recent double dissolution. You're choosing your six senators. You're writing a very large number of preferences below the line. How do three or four million long lists of preferences get turned into yeah. six senators? Well, it's really complicated. Yeah. If, you've got, if you've got four million of those and you're electing 21 members, you end up with ballot papers at fractional values and you're having to transfer 1.3 million ballot papers at a value of 0.22. Right. It becomes extremely complex and you can't do it by hand. You'll be tested on this later. <laughs> so there are two important piece, parts of the electronic process here. Yeah. One is that both in the Senate and in New South Wales, the ballot paper is automatically scanned and there's a computer scanner which translates your pencil marks into an electronic record of how you voted. That's step number one. Step number two is that the actual count, in other words, the translation between those lists of preferences and the list of candidates who got elected, is also done by computer. Now, either of these things could go wrong. In the, the case that Suled is referring to, we found an error in the code that is used in New South Wales to count both local government elections and also the Legislative Council. We didn't actually get any, we didn't actually find any wrong answers in the Legislative Council. But in the local government elections, we found that a bug in the program had substantially altered the probability of how the candidates came out. And there was one candidate in particular who really ought to have won the election with more than 90% probability, who, because of the bug, didn't win a seat. And the, the bug in the official code lowered her probability of winning below 10% and she didn't win. So this shows a few things. First of all, this whole discussion about election hacking and manipulation is important, but equally important is the discussion about whether just plain old bugs in the software could cause us to get the wrong answer. And that goes for any of it. It goes for the optical character recognition systems and it goes for the counting systems too. If anything, the counting systems are the least of our worries because they're the part that we can actually test. So we could find the error precisely because we could look at the data, look at the New South Wales Electoral Commission's transcripts and see whether or not they were right. <laughs> right, which they weren't. So that brings me to the second use, major use of computers in Australian elections, which is for the actual voting. And this is the part that causes me the most concern. There are really two ways of voting on a computer. One is putting a computer in a polling place. And uh, as Anthony already mentioned, that's done in the ACT. It was also trialled in the most recent Victorian state election. I don't think they're going to continue it. And there have they've been little trials in West Australia and Tasmania. The idea that the way to do that well is by printing out a piece of paper that the voter can check to see whether or not it really is their vote. And then you can use that piece of paper as evidence later in case there's a bug in the program, an allegation that it was hacked or just some kind of IT stuff up, and it allows you to go back to the evidence. The internet voting system, which, is, which was first trialled in New South Wales and is rapidly spreading across the nation, is another matter entirely because it doesn't give you the evidence about how you voted and whether or not it went properly into the count. Um, do you... Um uh, see, is there a difference between the ACT's uh, electronic voting and, for example, New South Wales system that's fundamental to transparency in some way? So the ACT system is a much older system. It's been open source ever since it began. And in some ways it actually predates the tremendous discussions that happened in the United States over Diebold and um, election manipulation using direct recording electronic voting systems. I think it was actually very forward, the ACT system was actually very forward looking back in the day when it was first put out there. It's been, its source code is mostly openly available, it's a very transparent and simple system. 
However, because it doesn't produce paper evidence, the voters really aren't getting any evidence that their votes were recorded in the way that they intended. And you can spend all the time you like investigating the source code and looking for bugs, which is all good, it's a positive thing, but it doesn't actually produce the evidence trail, even though it's much more transparent than... I mean, the, the New South Wales system has neither openly available source code nor a paper trail, so basically people vote and then an answer is produced and there is very little logical connection between the two, as far as I can see. Um, I'm interested in uh, how um, you all actually found the bug. Can you describe the story a bit about the process of finding the bug? Oh, sorry, are you talking about the counting bug in New South Wales? Or shall we shift on to... Yeah, um, shift on to the... the, <laughs> the all right, the so there are two yeah. stories here, just to be clear. So one, we found a bug in the counting software in New South Wales. The second... Oh, actually, the prior and in some ways more interesting story is... Um, Alex Haldeman and I found a security hole in the internet voting system that is used in New South Wales. And the rough way that this happened is because the system, in some ways the system was architected like any other secure website, right? You were making your connection to the main electronic voting server and you were downloading a bunch of stuff including some code to encrypt your vote and all that, you know. All the usual stuff that you would expect. And also, your browser was instructed to make a call to collect some analytics JavaScript from a different <laughs> website <laughs> that was neither under the control of the Electoral Commission nor properly defended, nor properly configured to defend itself against some already known attacks on the internet, and particularly the freak attack, which was a known issue. So what we showed was that this vulnerability from this third-party server could be used by an attacker to take control of the person's voting system, to expose how they intended to vote and then to manipulate their vote and send back whatever vote the attacker wanted back to the Electoral Commission. Uh, it wouldn't have raised any browser warnings, it wouldn't have looked at all untoward at the Electoral Commission end. In fact, it would have looked exactly like a legitimate vote, it just wouldn't have been the vote that the person wanted to cast. And would that have been had to be done on a one-to-one -one basis, so quite expensive per vote, or could it have been an automated system that would have changed thousands of votes without anyone seeing it? Exactly. And this, is, this to me is the key difference between the kinds of stuff-ups and cheating that can happen in paper systems and the kind of large-scale undetectable manipulation that can be possible in a fully automated system. Because the answer is... You could, you could write one program, you could hack into one key router or website, and you could manipulate all of the votes that anybody passed through that particular point. If the point you've broken into happens to be the server that's serving the code or the ISP that that server uses, that means one program, one person can manipulate all 280,000 votes that were input from that system into the state election. Be scared, very scared. scared. <laughs> um, just before we come back to you, Marcy, a question, Anthony. Can you tell us what happened in the WLA election uh, with Scott Ludlam that, not the most recent unfortunate issues with Scott Ludlam, but um, the WA election where um, a ballot box uh, votes went missing, some 1,300, I think it was, uh, votes went missing? I'll, I'll do it. There's actually not only the problems that Vanessa was describing, there were three other problems in that election um, with the up house. One, um, initially they got the electronic ballot paper wrong and it was missing a couple of boxes. They, they fixed that one pretty quickly. Um, second, um, because, because of the... You're asking people to vote on a screen, people aren't always particularly literate. They were getting a form which showed the first four or six columns and then you scroll right and people didn't realise you could scroll right and there was clear bias towards the parties that had appeared on the left-hand side of the ballot paper. And on top of that, the donkey vote as well, which appears. Um, one of the difficulties, people, when they, you talk about ballot papers like this, or that was the last Senate one here in New South Wales, when you unfold it, <laughs> um, is that 
uh, people say, oh, you can sort of sort out the problems of the ballot paper online. Well, I think online you can get even worse sort of biases in the filling in of the ballot paper as you do off a paper ballot paper. The structure, I mean, one of the arguments I've always had up against these giant ballot papers, it actually interferes with the way people vote. They can't find the candidates they know and they end up voting for candidates they don't know because that's what they discover. Yes. So. I, I think in the end you also have to deal with the electoral laws on the way, whether it's electronic or paper or whatever. So I agree very much with that and I think it's really interesting that this, the distortions caused by that problem were actually very large. So two really interesting things about that. First of all, you might attribute that to voters not necessarily being very good at using computers. I would say that was a user interface bug. That was just a programming error. There were yep. big red arrows and when you clicked on them, yep. they didn't move the ballot. And also the simple issue in that one was that in the ACT with their electronic voting, it randomly drops you on a position on the ballot paper. So if people are confused about scrolling and the like, it's not helping one party over any other. So Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah. And, and on the WA Going back stuff. to the WA, <coughs> I mean, that's an example of a manual system. Obviously, if you lose some 1,300 votes, it was going to affect the outcome. Just interested to know what happened in that strange and mysterious situation. Well, I'll, I'll also say about the electronic voting, um, the calculation bug you found. Um, of course, when the calculation bug occurs manually, nobody knows. And, and, and I can go back through it. You can point out where bugs have occurred. And look, there was a, someone elected by the STV system back in the 1920s, and the elect returning officer used the wrong formula and it was later overturned. So you, you, you get manual errors in this as well. And, and there were certainly manual errors in WA, which is actually the bigger issue than the missing ballot papers. First off, we had, for those of you familiar with our stupid ticket voting system. There we are, one of those. <laughs> There's the magnifying sheet to read it. <laughs> as, as I said at that election, if people think, you know, if, if, if there's a choice between allowing anybody to run on a ballot paper and being able to give a ballot paper that voters can understand and read, then I go for the understanding and reading any day over the right to stand as a candidate. You've got to give people something they understand. And I also think it was a national disgrace that we held an election where people couldn't read the ballot paper without a magnifying sheet. And people said, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, yes, there is. But they gave us the magnifying glass. Surely that was oh. good enough, Anthony. <laughs> no, they should have sorted out the laws first. The, the thing with Scott Ludlam was that there were two candidates who finished ninth and tenth in that election. And they were under 20 votes apart. Neither of them could get elected. Both of them had about one and three quarter percent. And because of that stupid ticket voting system, the order of that ninth and tenth place candidates cascaded through and elected the last two senators. And it changed entirely depending on which order ninth and tenth finished. No electoral system should be so unstable in the count that that can happen. And then what happened was when you lost, uh, at the end of election, the count, votes were all counted on the night. They're counted again back when their returning officers have got them. And then for the Senate, they're all sent away to a shed, a big storage company where they're kept for six years by law in case someone um, dies and they have to do a recount. Or like in the current case of Scott Ludlam, if you get disqualified, they have to count the votes again. Now, thankfully, we don't have to count the paper ballots, but they still have to keep them just in case they lose the computer records. Um, but what happened was in that transfer, nobody's ever taken the ballot papers out having put them in a storage. Well, they lost 1,300 ballot papers. 1,300 didn't get to the storage centre when they started the recount. Um, it's almost certainly that the ballot papers in that particular district were all on the edge of a uh, uh, delivery dock to be taken away. And also on the delivery dock was a whole bunch of paper which was being taken away for disposal. You know, ballot boxes, ballot screens, um, bits and pieces of paper. It's highly likely that something got mixed up there. Uh, and that's the most likely situation. Um, if the voting system wasn't so susceptible to being distorted and it hadn't been so big, there might have been, they would have less handling problems. If you've got a ballot paper that big, the a New South Wales Electoral Commission had to hire bigger planes to fly the ballot papers to Broken Hill. They had to hire heavier forklifts to move them around the, f the voting centre. And just to be completely hysterical, right in the middle of the counting of these ballot papers, they had a gigantic, one of the biggest thunderstorms in New South Wales history, hailstorms, and it destroyed the roof of the storage room where these were all sealed up in plastic bags. And the roof of the room was made of asbestos. So to access the ballot papers, they all had to wear moon suits. Um, 
There were so many things that could have invalidated that entire election, which entirely caused by the size of that ballot paper, and thankfully nobody challenged it. Um, but it, it, it's actually an ex example of you need to make sure your laws are updated. If you move to computerised voting, there's a whole bunch of things you do with the, you change with the form. The electronic votes in the lower house in New South Wales, we use optional preferential voting, that the proportion of people who gave preferences on their ballot paper was 30% higher on the electronic votes compared to every other vote. And it's to do with the way the form is presented. You tick a box and say, ding, do you want to give another preference? And I go, yes, tick, ding, do you want to give another preference? Whereas on the actual ballot paper itself, it didn't prompt you to do. And that's clearly had an impact, which is uh, one of those odd unintended consequences. Um, j uh, Vanessa, I just um, want to ask your view, is the paper-based system um, in WA, which obviously we have risks um, to the integrity of the system from loss, does it also have a fail-safe mechanism such that the WA situation was eventually discovered by all of us? Yeah, I think there's a really interesting comparison between the WA problems in the West Australian Senate election of 2013 and the iVote problems in the New South Wales state election in 2015. In Western Australia, we saw a problem. It was a serious problem. We knew that it had happened. The Electoral Commission was immediately and completely honest about it. And when they decided that they couldn't fix the problem, they reran the election. Now, that's not what you want to happen in every election, but you could also look at that as a triumph of robust process. It happened, it went a little wrong, it got fixed. We found out about it and it got fixed. If you look at the shenanigans around the 2015 New South Wales state election, there was this security problem that we found. We, do, we don't know whether anybody exploited that vulnerability. We don't know whether there were bugs in the software. There was this distortion, particularly in the Legislative Council. We don't know whether that was caused by the user interface problems or by voters not understanding how to scroll. Who knows? We, we don't know exactly what went wrong. The iVote system did have this very limited telephone-based voter verification mechanism. So the idea was you were supposed to be able to telephone a, a third party, basically enter your voting credentials and ask them what vote they had recorded on your behalf. And that's really the only opportunity for anybody to check whether their vote has been correctly recorded. Great for privacy, but never mind. At the time of the election, because they were very defensive over the security problem, the Electoral Commission put out a big, uh, big defence of their system and they said 1.7% of voters who used the iVote system also used the verification system. None of them reported any anomaly with their vote. So that was the official line at the time of the election. In the parliamentary hearings about the election more than a year later, the officials were asked exactly that question again. How many people tried to verify their vote but found that the verification failed? And they said, oh, well actually, Seven people pressed the button to say that their vote was not as they intended. Two of them subsequently said they didn't mean to. Okay, so that's five. And um, 600 people couldn't retrieve any vote at all. That's 10%. So 10% of the people who called up the system and tried to verify their vote couldn't retrieve anything. Now again, we don't exactly know why. It may be just that they couldn't remember their registration credentials. Like, who knows why? We don't know whether it really affected the votes or whether it just affected the verifications. But the thing that I think is really important is we didn't find out about it at the time, right? So contrast the West Australian scenario. There was a problem. They were honest about it. We found out about it. We fixed it. The New South Wales scenario, there may very well have been a problem. We didn't find out about it and we didn't get the chance to address it until more than a year after the election when it was all over. Uh, just, just on the WA thing, though, um, everyone's obsessed about the missing ballots. What is more remarkable was that, and this is a problem of the paper-based system, is in the recount it was absolutely clear that in uh, two-thirds of the returning officers didn't know how, what an informal vote was. And so if you marked the vote above and below the line in, in the, the Senate, um, it has to be data entered because the vote could be formal. But two-thirds of the returning officers in WA looked at it and went, you can't mark above and below the line, it's informal. So it never went to data entry. And it was only when they did the recount, they found thousands of extra votes. 
So it wasn't just the missing ballot papers. Um, the recount actually revealed that um, the manual counting didn't have the rules. And of course, there was no scrutineering of the Senate because nobody bothered to look. It's a different thing in the House of Representatives in the lower houses because people are looking at the ballot papers because they know the close contests and they all turn up. In the Senate, this election went on completely with no scrutineering conducted by the Electoral Commission and then it all fell over at the end. And it was clear about a week out that there was a problem and nobody in the Electoral Commission realised. So, Marcy, I'm interested in um, this uh, suggestion that in a discussion you know, we had uh, about drawing a distinction between intelligence gathering hacks and attempts to damage or disable and interfere. We've seen a lot of allegations of countries hacking each other, hacking for IP, hacking for information, interfering in elections. Um, we've had a report of 20 plus state operations allegedly by the Russian government in the United States on voter registration systems there. Can you talk a little bit about that and was this a setup for interference or was it a setup um, for trying to gather intelligence? And what does that mean, in a sense, for what we can expect in the future landscape, other countries, whatever, as we move towards e-voting? Well, one of the things, when it was happening in real time, uh, so last September, there were these reports that there were these probes of state voter registration databases. And everyone's like, dude, this happens all the time. And the reason it happens all the time is that there is a history of criminal hackers pulling these voter registration databases because there's a ton of information there. It's a great place to get PII, to get personally identifiable information, and use it for marketing or use it to scam people or use it to steal credit cards or what have you. There was actually, since November, a case where 190 million voter rec enhanced voter records so Enhanced. with things like social security numbers, um, what kind of uh, laundry detergent you buy, what kind of neighborhood you live in. And it was all there on an unprotected server. And some people believe it was a Republican effort to cheat, to coordinate between uh, entities that weren't allowed to coordinate. And some people think it was just a way to steal information for marketing purposes or for, for uh, ID theft purposes. So back, sep back in September, everyone assumed it's just more identity theft. It happens all the time. And then as we got closer to the election, it, it, there was more evidence to suggest it was an effort to potentially alter the vote or potentially um, you know, have a voter show up and try and cast a vote and find out they weren't on the voting rolls. And the, and the really important thing, I mean, here in Australia, you have to vote, right? In the United States, it's the reverse. There's a ginormous game to try and prevent people, poorer people, people of color, students um, from voting. And it, it's an entire industry. And so... Can you tell us just a little bit about what that voter repression, as it's called, industry actually is and how it manifests for an average person? Well, I mean, it, it, the, the, like one way they do it is with voter IDs. So they, they impose new requirements on what kind of ID you na need to have to be able to vote. And if you don't happen to have a driver's license, which a lot of young people don't, then you have to pay the money to go get a driver's license, which could involve a two-hour drive, uh, take time off work to get it. And that means those people are going to have to work harder to vote than people who commute to work every day. Um, they, another way they do it is if you haven't voted for a couple of elections, they'll just purge you. And so you may show up and think that you're registered to vote and find out that you know that that somebody at the at the polls say that you can't vote, and so there's there's a ton of ways to do this, and what it ends up doing is suppressing the vote. It tends to be it tends to suppress Democratic voters, um, and Republicans have done this for for decades, um, and it and even in this past election, the effect on Wisconsin, which again was one of these three states that Trump won that Hillary was expected to win. The effect on Wisconsin was demonstrable and certainly big enough to affect the election. So we hear a lot about the Russians stealing the vote. Mm -hmm. Republicans had already done it, right? You know, it, so Putin they hacked got themselves. There, they yeah, hacked Putin themselves. got there late to the game because <laughs> Republicans had already stolen the state of Wisconsin. And this is something in the United States that there, you know, there's there's just no discussion about how to fix this voter suppression. Um, it keeps going up to the Supreme Court. It keeps being deemed illegal. In North Carolina, especially, it was the guy who's investigating the Russian hack in the Senate, who's in charge of the investigation, 
is in the Senate still today because of the extreme voter suppression efforts in North Carolina. He, he had a, an unbelievably close vote, really extreme voter suppression efforts in North Carolina. So he's now in the Senate still because of voter suppression on the behalf of the Republicans, and he's investigating similar kinds of activities on the part of the, of the Russians. And, and there's, yeah. there's, no, there's no discussion, really, in the United States that says, if it's wrong for the Russians, isn't it wrong for the Republicans? The, there's something else that has to be understood, and Australians tend to, to not notice this, is that in America, large parts of America, electoral officials are elected officials. So if you've got an area, it may have a Democrat or a Republican official who conducts the election and will do so in a partisan way. You have counties where, where they know there's a large black community in one area, and you know, you've got to take thousands and thousands of votes. They'll only appoint one polling place to make it as hard as possible for those people to vote. So there's, a, and, or there's the counties which are poorer will have poorer voting equipment, where you, so we saw the famous butterfly ballot paper. Um, the other thing is in most states, when you register to vote, you register as a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, which gives you the right to vote in the primaries. But therefore, they've already got information on you about why you're on the roll. And it's quite, you know, that's something else that sort of works in that area. There's all sorts of other sorts of odd things. I know this has come up in Canada, I presume it occurs in America. Well, they'll ring people up and tell them where a polling place is, and it's not there. So people waste their time trying to find where to vote. And so there's or all sorts of strange things. tell them it's the next day, or tell them, you know, that the voting location has changed. So this is an enormous game in the United States, but it's not at all funny because it means that a lot of people get discouraged from voting, their votes don't count, they end up... Um, one of the things that they... Here in Australia, if you show up to the wrong place to vote, your vote still gets counted. In Michigan, where I live, it, it doesn't. So I can't... I, I do voter protection, have done it for, th for three elections in a row. I can't tell you how discouraging it is to have a first-time student voter show up to the polling place close to their university to have to tell them, you've got to drive three hours to where your parents live because that's still where you're registered to vote. If you vote here, your vote will not count. And the other one is that um, in America, they will challenge people when they turn up to vote scrutiny. You know, representatives of the parties will pick anybody arriving of Middle Eastern appearance and saying, are you an American citizen? And, you know, and things, you know, whatever, usually, with, usually uh, confronting uh, African Americans. But if you, can you imagine what that would be like here if people were allowed to do that in our country? So it's sort of, a, you've got to understand that Everything in the process can be political in America, right down to who's running the election, how the roles are maintained, and how you vote, where polling places are allocated. And you've got to compare that with our system, which has its, you know, people try to fiddle it, but largely is left to electoral officials. And usually the problem you're dealing with is incompetence rather than sort of a direct political impact. We have a question just over here, if we can pass the cube or mic or something. <laughs> Beaten to the punchline. Wait, wait, you want the cube? Take the cube. Take the cube. No. Sorry, I don't have the cube. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, he's so depressed. He wanted to hand you the cube. <laughs> well, okay, so my, my question was basically about what Anthony was saying, where in the American system, it's so different to the Australian system where you can turn up anywhere to a polling booth, go, this is me, I don't even have to show my ID or a licence or anything. And they mark me off and I can vote. Whereas from what I understand in the American system, it's... it's no, yeah, it's nuts. It's, it's geared towards stopping people from voting. Um, voting stations are sparse. The queues are massive. They don't have a sausage sizzle. Um, so, yeah, it's, like it's a very, very different um, space compared to what I'm used to as an Australian. So, um, yeah, I suppose... I mean, Anthony's basically covered that. The, 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 the joker... Uh, an academic friend of mine has always used that in Australia it's easier to vote than to not vote. There are yeah, so true. many ways to vote, but if you don't vote, you get this bloody fine notice afterwards, and you've got to yeah, deal with it. Yeah, but it's Australia; it, everyone ignores it. it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, there are. I mean, if you go to Britain, you'll find you have to vote at a fixed polling place, and and that's one of the reasons why their turnout is lower. There are just some people who just are not able to vote because they can't get to a, the, their polling place. Well, and it's yeah. and voting day is Tuesday. Right? You know, you, you could have voting day on Sunday and more working people could vote, not all of them. Um, we still have caucuses, so in the primary process, 
Um, I, I was working in 2004 in Iowa, so the first state to vote in caucuses, and trying to get people to come out to vote. And I can't tell you how many people said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a waiter. I cannot give up a Tuesday night, which is going to be $300 of income, to go vote in a caucus. And so that, you know, that has a habit of, of making more affluent people available to vote and people who've got more flexibility. And so, yeah, there's, a, there's so much of that baked into the American system. Um, the notion that, well, the Russians stole our election this year, and yet we're still not having a conversation, and nor did we in 2000 when our, when our national election was a catastrophe as well. We still haven't fixed the problems from 2000, much less the problems that came up last year independent of any Russian effort. Um, does someone want the orange cube? Yes, we've got an orange cube candidate down the back there. <laughs> oh, yep, yep, pass it down. Really? Is this? Oh, okay, I feel ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um, you kind of just covered it just then, but my question was a quick one. Is this has been a lot of focus about the last election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Well, what are your opinions, specifically Marcy, about in Al Gore and George Bush in 2000 when the consequences of that election were huge and dragged Australia into two wars that we're still in right now, destroyed the American economy, you could make an argument for, and there's no discussion about it. No one talks about how Governor Bush should maybe not have got elected. Do you believe that was a Republican? Do you believe the Republican interference, which you just discussed, had an impact on that election, or do you think that was just incompetence, like <coughs> Anthony mentioned? Great no, it question. wasn't just incompetence. You can look at Florida, and you can find more than the 500 <coughs> votes in Florida. Just in, um, in that vote, it was called vote caging, and you would, same kind of thing, that you would um, take people of color off the rolls. And you can look at just the city of Jacksonville, Florida, uh, would have made the difference in the state of Florida, would have made the difference in the national election. Al Gore still would have brought us to war, so sorry, you know. Uh, left, right, you're still gonna go to war with the United States, I apologize profusely. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, you know, and, and then the boat, you know, the, the butterfly ballot. Um, so over and over again, I mean, this has been going on for decades that there's this effort to suppress the vote and it's always people of color, it's always the poor, and it ends up really skewing our politics more conservative than you otherwise would have. And we, you know, we did have a Help America Vote Act after that, but one of the things that happened with the Help America Vote Act was a bunch of money going to big vendors to do these uh, paperless ballots. So, you know, what, what happened after 2000 was Diebold got a lot of money to, to, you know, this black box voting. So it didn't really help things much. The, um, um, and, um, so, so can uh, you see how history is repeating itself, right? So we had this Senate, we had this paper-based Senate voting debacle in West Australia. What happens? Millions of dollars get pushed into internet voting in New South Wales. They just got another $5 million and it's spreading across the nation. We are going to have exactly the same thing five or ten years from now. Everybody's going to turn around and go, oh, hang on, that was not the solution to our problem. The, the, the I'll just say also, the, uh, just may sound an odd concept, but it discount, even if you discount if you discount those things, uh, one of the things about the Florida result is the result was narrower than the margin of error of the counting equipment. Now, if you're wondering what I mean by a margin of error of counting equipment, even if you count by hand, there's a margin of error, because if you count the same 100,000 votes 100 times, they won't always add up to the same number every time. It's just one of those things. So if you get an ultra-close election and using a piece of equipment which has got a margin of error attached, you might find there's a margin of error in your result, yeah. And so even in Michigan, which was 10,000 votes different, that was not an automatic recount. And when, to the extent that there were recounts tried, one of the things we learned is the city of Detroit, which is you know a good 10% of the state, at least more than 10% of the state, just can't run an election because they don't have the money and the competent people and the bodies to run an election. And therefore, when I mean, one of the reasons we don't do recounts in the United States is because it's embarrassing to see how shoddy they are run. Was um, Detroit bankrupted? Yes, previously. Well, it's just there. Um, I mean, it's, it's very, it's very, uh, it's a city with very few public resources to be able to ensure the integrity of the electoral system. Right. So its machines are older. Um, the one city in the state that didn't have a scan to check you into the to the polls this year was Flint, which 
those of you who have heard about it, Flint is the state that had lead in its water, that, that the, the, state, the state kind of took over the city, rerouted their water, and ended up poisoning a bunch of children. Well, that, that city, which you know, Hillary Clinton made a big stink about during the campaign, that city had demonstrably worse access to uh, automated voting than any other city in Michigan. Question down the back. Thank you, and I'm sorry if I've missed this in the beginning. For the life of me, I can't work out the American Electoral College system. <laughs> I, 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 is there a logic to it? Is there any clarity to it? Does the general American voter understand it? Well, historically, it was because they didn't necessarily conduct elections. The college, in the very earliest days, was sometimes elected by the state congress. It, it, it goes right back to that, but the idea wasn't that the president wasn't directly elected. Right, I mean, yeah. it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was meant to make it a more representative state. Um, and to be fair, there's always been a preference for rural areas in the United States. So, I mean, I live in flyover country, and it sort of helps me out. It hurts California. California is 10% of the population. Uh, California doesn't get anywhere near its, its weight in, in Congress in the vote they're of course counted last so the vote the the race is already almost always called by the time californians are finishing the vote so it, it doesn't make any sense there are there are threats to kind of tinker around the edges to to apportion votes uh there are two states that already do this that don't do a winner take all um and there are some threats to move towards more representative voting but um you know the, the fact of the matter is you need to break up the power structure which prefers rural areas. You need to break up. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that make rural areas more powerful than cities. And, and the powers that be would like to keep it that way. And so it's going to take a lot to, to, to make that change. One thing that I didn't mention earlier, which is also important to know about American elections, is most states uh, disenfranchise felons. So go to prison, serve your time. You come out, and you are disenfranchised for life. And that's another thing that had a really big impact in the Florida 2000 election. Can, can you also, you did mention, just we will come to your question, but um, about uh, a, a hack, if you will, of uh, election where um, these prisons are put in rural areas, but the numbers are counted. Maybe you can describe it in a bit of detail. Right, it's sort of, so when we still had slavery, right, and we, the Constitution is written such, sla such that slaves counted as three-fifths person, we still have something very similar to that operating now, which is that if you have a prison in your district, those prisoners, none of whom can vote, are counted in your apportionment for representation. So all of these rural areas are, you know, they're losing whatever else economy they have. They're bringing in prisons. They get to add, say, 10,000 people, who, none of whom will ever get to vote but they get their strength of voting in whether you know, adding a congressman or, or something like that. So again, it's another thing that, that uh, helps rural areas have more power than they otherwise would have. And you were... Can I ask, can I ask the court? Ah, the, yes, actually the high court ruled on that. <clears throat> um, um, prisoners, I, I think the rule is if they have a uh, sentence of under three years, uh, Send them under three years, they can uh, they can stay on the electoral. If they're if they're in prison for a longer period, I think they can be struck off. Uh, well, um, so so that's not counted as their um, registered address. Well, actually, the, the, something slightly similar happens here. The seats are allocated to states in Australia based on population, but the electoral boundaries are drawn based on enrolment. Um, yeah. So within each state, something like that wouldn't matter because it takes gone on the number of voters enrolled in the district. Do we have another question that I missed from back there? Oh, we've just got one down here in the front. I just have a question for Vanessa, based on what you said before about you can get a little piece of paper as a receipt from an electronic voting machine that is in person. You go to a polling place, but you don't if it is an internet-based one online. Is that actually, in theory, possible? Could someone make a system whereby you could internet vote and get a proper, secure verification back? This is a good question. I mean, this is really my core little area of research. And the answer is, if you're a member of the International Association for Cryptologic Researchers, then there are good <laughs> protocols available to you. And all you have to do is learn how 
certain kinds of really nifty online challenging and uh, vote verification work, and then it's all good to go. <laughs> there are two important things wrong with go the and get a PhD. system <laughs> used by the IACR. Number one, if you don't understand how to do the challenging very carefully, you can be fooled. So there wasn't any point having the verification process anyway. And number two, the system doesn't defend against coercion. So you can still prove after the fact how you vote it. Even though the system doesn't automatically expose it, if somebody comes along with $10 or a rubber hose, you can prove using maths what vote was recorded for you. So the answer is there are systems, but none of them are really something that could reasonably be used in ordinary government elections for ordinary people today. I, I add two things to that. One is, um, with electronic voting um, at a polling... I, I'm, a, I'm not in favour of mass internet voting because I happen to believe in attendance voting. Elections are important, the process is important, you should still be turning up and, you know, that's your statement. Um, it may be down the track that the, the structure of how polling places work stuff may change with more electronic voting. But the, the reason for the receipt, yes, you can verify that's what it said, but really the point is you get the receipt and you put it in a ballot box on the way out. That is so that if something goes wrong, there is some mechanism which allows it to be to counted manually. It makes in an era when people are always concerned that computers will lose everything, it adds that level of confidence. On the electronic voting, uh, on the internet voting, internet voting is useful for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to vote. Now, in Tasmania, you're allowed to fax in a vote from overseas, and that's simply because of the difficulty getting the ballot papers back. One of the consequences of faxing your ballot paper is your vote is not as secret as it could be. Uh, and so if you're prepared to say with internet, and there are ways you can send someone an email back with recording how they voted. It's not as secret as it used to be. Now, that's one of the problems. So there's a trade-off there you can have. If you're going to allow people who are going to struggle to vote unless you provide internet voting, is one, of the cons is one of the things, are they prepared to accept some loss of secrecy just so they can maintain their vote? In theory, it's a loss of secrecy, but in practice it probably isn't. Yeah. My concern is the loss of integrity as well, right? I think if that little tick the box said, your vote may not be private and your vote may be manipulated by the following, then I think that would be a very different... If you live in Baluchistan and, and the only way you can vote is by internet in Australia, what do you do? <laughs> if you live in Baluchistan, then you probably shouldn't be voting in Australian no, elections no, unless you, yeah. you happen to be an Australian yeah. citizen. <clears throat> but I do think, I mean, that is... There are you know, thousands of Australians around the world and some of them just cannot vote because they cannot get a post to vote and they cannot get to an embassy. They're in Baluchistan yeah. fighting that war that the yeah. United <laughs> States started. I mean, we had, we had um, the Munding Borough by-election years, it was overturned because the Electoral Commission didn't get the ballot papers to some defence forces in, in time. How um, um, concerned, Marcy, do you think that the um, intelligence community is, the national security community is genuinely in Washington about uh, the idea of a foreign power hacking in one form or another through ga gathering information or interfering in the US election versus it just being a political football of political sort of point scoring and um, you know one party trying to get back at another. You know I think it mattered that it was Russia. Uh, Israel has unbelievable influence on our political process in the United States, and no one ever seems to blink about that. Um, Saudi Arabia has unbelievable influence on our political process in the United States. No one seems to blink at that either. So I think what mattered this year is an entity that is viewed as an adversary, especially by the CIA, uh, interfered in the vote in a way that probably wasn't as influential as Israel or Saudi Arabia in any given year, but that mattered more to them. Um, and so uh, is that the right decision? Pro probably not. I mean, th there's a larger question of foreign influence in, especially in the United States, in, in our voting process more generally, foreign money in our voting process more generally. And again, that's a conversation that is not being had. And, and you would not have it. It would be very difficult to have in the United States to say, we need to make sure that Israel stops influencing American elections because so many politicians in, I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a bill in Congress right now that wants to make it illegal to support BDS in the United States. 
you know, and, and that, is, that is, is being rushed through Congress, and that's how powerful Israel is in the United States Congress, so. Other questions, any more? Qu yep, we've got one and two, just one here on the aisle first, and then two over here. Um, so if um, the US adopted mandatory voting like we do in Australia, do you think that would solve the election problems in the US? Um, I think it would still be gamed. You know, like if, if everyone ha had to vote, um, then you would have to change the infrastructure of the vote so much that it would be harder to game in the ways that they currently game. Then you're going to see hacking of the machines. Um, you know, one of the things, like in November, one of the things, bizarrely, people said, took solace in was that well, it's really hard to hack the entire state because, because of what Anthony said, is that these counties all run the election. But as you move more towards a nationalized vote system, then it becomes easier to hack in, in bulk. One of the things that's going on in the states right now is there's this guy named Chris Kobach who is like the best vote suppressor in the country. And he has been appointed by Trump to a, a voting fraud commission and he wrote to all 50 states send, saying, send me your voting data with the notion that he was going to like check double voters, you know, check people who are registered in more than two states. Tons of Republicans are, didn't matter. His own state, he's from Kansas, his own state, he is the Secretary of State in that state, refused to give him, so Chris Kobach refused to give Chris Kobach the information Chris Kobach asked for. Um, because it is considered, because there's such a strong bias towards federalism in the United States, but as these states, one after another, said, no, we don't want to give you our data, Chris Kobach, who wouldn't give himself the data, said, what are you trying to hide? <laughs> but there's already a, a lot of anecdotal evidence of people, particularly Latinos, who are pulling themselves out the voting rolls because they feel like they're going to be, you know, the law enforcement is going to start cracking down on them. And so that you, you're going to see something else happen if you made it, if you made required voting. Wow. So people are potentially actually afraid to be on a voter roll because they think the police might knock on their door for one reason or another. Right, because it, uh, Trump's crackdown on, on Latinos especially is, is really uh, driving a lot of fear in the Latino communities. And as a result, the, just the notion that you're going to attract extra attention from the government um, regardless of who you are, uh, especially if you have family members who are not documented, is, is leading people to pull themselves off the voter rolls, even if they are citizens. We had another question over here. Good catch, good catch of the cube. Um, so I want to ask you about social media. Um, how do you think it's used now? And do you think it will play a bigger role than it is now? Because I know in the US it's used a lot differently to it is in Australia, to get people to vote and stuff like that. In Australia, the major parties particularly use it as a one-way communicating. It's, here's our thing, look at it. Do you think it will ever move to the step of the two-way, where it's more so used like that on Twitter, where they'll reply to stuff like that? And yeah, what do you think about that? You're asking me? No, just all, all of you. Uh, um, you know, one of the things, like I, I talked about, there's more attention being paid to whether Russian bots um, targeted me, a targeted people of color in Michigan to uh, make us believe that Hillary was a crazy person. Um, and it's funny because even Democrats I know who are, you know, party, party hacks, I'm like, do you care about this? They're like, no, this is the same thing that Obama used to get elected. This kind of targeting is the same thing that Obama used to get elected. And so we are not going to oppose this kind of really detailed uh, targeting. And, it, and I keep going back and it's like, if this is a problem, the problem is in Silicon Valley as much as it is in Moscow, because it is the algorithms that drive certain kinds of traffic uh, that makes it susceptible to vote. Those of you who are interested in this, though, should look up the company Cambridge Analytica. There's been a lot of attention on whether um, whether they really abused this process. Cambridge Analytica's parent company is a company called SCL that does. Popul population management for NATO. So they are believed to have used tactics that the United States uses in that war that we started in Afghanistan, Baluchistan, um, to kind of keep the population 
docile, and they use those same tactics with voters in the United States. So that is something that investigators in the Congress are looking at. Um, and it's, un I mean, one of the things, one of the things that I think we're going to see as the aftermath of this goes on is, is y Democrats want to say it was all Russians, but I don't think they're going to be able to draw a line between where the Russians ended and where the Republicans started, or even the, you know, even the Bernie voters started. And so um, Facebook released a really interesting report claiming that 0.1% of their election-based activity was malicious, they mean Russian, they didn't say Russian, but malicious activity, and the rest was all real people responding to real beliefs, um, and those are, the, those are the Republicans and the Bernie voters. Um, and so you, ca you really can't distinguish between the two, and, and, it's, and it's an interesting question, but it is as much about how, uh, Obama said something really interesting in his December statement on the election. He's like, you know, we, to the extent the Russians stole the election, they did it because our, our civic culture is broken, right? And that's where you really need to fix it uh, because you need to not be susceptible to bots or to people going crazy in a Facebook algorithm. The the um, another thing to also be aware of is in America, all the analytics and social media and stuff. A lot of that is built around the process of turnout. Is you identify people who may or may not turn out. It's also identifying your base, trying to figure out your base who would normally vote for you. Are they going to turn out? And also to do with the primary process where you're really only dealing with the partisans and the people who are really interested, and you've got to mobilise them. In this country, um, the traditional view has always been that. You win an election by getting into the heads of the people who aren't that interested and turn up on the day and vote. And so you get the repetitive message in the news because that's what everybody's watching. The Labour Party has, and Get Up, have had quite a particular impact on them in recent years because they've gone back to actually talking to people and knocking on doors and ringing them up, particularly ringing them up, the Labour Party, Get Up much more in mobilising through particular groups and social media. And the Conservatives are very concerned that that's had quite an impact because suddenly this more direct form of voting is having an impact. So that's the interesting things in that area. Yeah. Um, yeah. About door knocking, I've done that before, and you're right, it, you go to someone's house and you have a conversation with them, hi, I'm from here, we're here to talk about this. And I've had people going, oh, you actually want to listen to what I want to say? And I'm like, yeah, I do, and I'm writing everything down. And I've found that to be a lot, when you're engaging with a voter, standing there and asking them what they want instead of telling them helps a lot. So you go to their door and it's someone's house on a Sunday morning, you go, hi, I'm here to, what's your local issues you don't like? And they're like, oh, the shops are pretty crap. What can you do about <coughs> them? And I'm like, there well, was a no Parts of the Liberal Party were pushing for voluntary voting back in the 90s um, because their view was that, um, and, and as we know, if you go back to the history of um, voluntary uh, compulsory voting in Australia, it was brought in by conservative parties who were concerned that middle class people didn't turn out and vote and the Labor Party and the unions were much better at getting turnout, and that's why it was introduced 100 years ago. In more recent years, it was viewed that Labor Party, Party voters were more disenchanted, more disinterested, and it would hurt Labor. But during the, um, do you remember had a voluntary vote, you might not remember, a voluntary vote for a, re a convention on having a republic in 99, um, and the turnout was highest in Labor electorates, and the Labor Party and the unions have put a lot of effort into that, and suddenly the, the parts of the Liberal Party moved away from voluntary voting again. They suddenly realised there were more troops on the ground. And the 2007 fe federal election and the last Queensland election showed that the unions could still mobilise a workforce the campaign and sort of um, direct getting involved in politics rather than just advertising has suddenly had more impact in Australian politics than it's had right, for a long and, time. And two things that haven't gotten as much attention in the United States as they should have is one of the differences between what, what Hillary did and what Obama did is Obama was in all the rural areas. He wasn't going to win those areas, but he kept the vote close. And Hillary just didn't show up. So one of the things that happened between 2012 and 2016 is Hillary didn't show up. The other thing that happened in both Wisconsin and especially Michigan is Michigan turned into a right-to-work state, meaning the, 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 the unions in both Michigan and Wisconsin were devastated between 2012 and 2016. And that's who got turnout among working people and, and those forces to get people out to the votes uh, just were, were devastated between 2012 and 2016. Probably a bigger effect than the Russians had on the election, but not something that we're really talking about. Just back to what you were saying about door knocking and stuff, Anthony, with the Conservatives not really doing it. I'm from the um, ACT, and during that ACT election, 
um, I'd go out door knocking in groups of, I think, 15 people, and we're able to knock out three, 300 homes in an afternoon, and then I'd talk to some of the Liberal people that would be door knocking, and it'd just be the candidate by themselves. And it just puzzled me, because they could do, what, three, four streets in a couple of hours, if that, and it just struck me really weird as why they wouldn't, they weren't able to mobilise a lot of people to it's, get out. It's, uh, it's, it's partly for the Liberal Party that uh, you'd probably find yeah. that their candidates are all over the aged Tea Parties. And <laughs> the, um, it's to do with the age base of the, of the Labor Party. And the Labor Party in most states has got a pretty old base as well. If you tap into the union movement, you've got a lot more activists who get involved in get-ups, particularly in Tasmania at the last federal election, a huge impact with this on-the-ground campaign. Um, if there are no more questions, unless someone... Oh, wait, there's one more shooting just here in the centre with the orange box. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, because a lot of us vote based on the information we get access to. And with, in this new age where I don't spend a lot of time at home watching TV, I get my news from the internet. And surprisingly enough, I get a lot of news feed about cats. Whereas Robin gets news feeds about digital privacy and all those sorts of things. Do you think that's made a change in the way we vote about um, who's sending us the information and what we see? And do you think that's going to be a big threat or a big change to how we vote in the future? Wait till you're older. Uh, Wait till you're older. I get um, <laughs> prostate awareness and erectile dysfunction. <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask, is this a conspiracy of cats? <laughs> This, to me, is the thing that's really scary about these giant databases that Cambridge Analytica and friends pick up. It's not necessarily that they know a lot about you. It's the capacity to tell you exactly what you want to hear in the context of encouraging you to vote for a particular candidate. And so the thing that used to happen where people would go around door knocking and basically telling everybody what they wanted to hear, sorry, can now be done on a massive scale very, very precisely, like the thing that was terrifying about this Republican database that was leaked online was the precision and detail. They knew all kinds of things. They knew what you thought about the death penalty and what you thought about immigrants and what you thought about US foreign, foreign policy. Tremendous detail. And it can look as if you're getting a genuine political platform when in fact what you're getting is your own views repeated back to you. Uh, I think it bodes very badly for democracy and it concentrates power in the hands of a tiny number of people. And I don't mean Cambridge Analytica, I mean Facebook and Twitter. Uh, where We used to have concerns about media ownership concentration when one person would own the newspaper and the TV in the same city. Ponder how many people can be politically influenced by Mark Zuckerberg today. Billions of people all over the planet. Right, and, and the other thing that is exacerbates that too is, again, the areas where Trump won the election are areas that have no local press left. And so they have to get their news either from cable news or from Facebook because there is no local press left. Um, I guess the last question before we close up, and we will close up, um, and it's really a question from Marcy, uh, is the U.S. ever coming back from all this? <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think, um, you know, we keep waiting for Republicans in Congress to, to hit a level where Trump's imminent pardon of himself will bother them. But I also think, um, you know, I think that they're letting Trump do all the unpopular things. They all would prefer Mike Pence. To a, to a one, every Republican in Congress would prefer Mike Pence, I think. And so Mike Pence is nobody's gift to civic culture either. And and that's what concerns me is, and, and frankly, Mike Pence is much more closely tied to the David Cokes of the world, to the big oligarch money of the world than Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump is himself an oligarch, but Mike Pence is owned by oligarchs. And so that's what's, that's what's uh, in line. And I think Trump is keeping Republicans in line with things like this voter fraud task force. Uh, so they know he's going to work to suppress the vote on a much more ambitious level than has happened in the past, and that's what really concerns me. We're going to have to wrap up because uh, we're time limited by a bunch of comedians who are going to troop on stage very shortly after this. But thank you very much for coming today, and thank you very much to our panelists. A big round of applause, please, for fantastic panelists.
And if you're interested in uh, improving the security or privacy of your devices, come tomorrow to the science tent from 12.30 to 1. There'll be a whole group of us there who will help you up the security, your cybersecurity of your phones and tablets, uh, so that you too won't get hacked. Take care.